So OS bridge, open source, open data, open access, and open opportunity. Those are all things that Mozilla tries to live by. Sometimes we're better at it than others. Uh, in the last few years, in some ways, we've kind of lost our way, but we're attempting to regain it. And one of the things, I mean, people think of Mozilla, they think of Firefox. There are other products that Mozilla makes, some that you have never heard of. And the one I'm going to speak about today is called Socorro. When Firefox crashes, that's Socorro. So, not yet. Although I may just suddenly throw my, there we go. <laughs> this is going, my screen isn't updating as fast as it is up there. So how many people have seen this dialog box? How many people have just, you know, quit Firefox, just not sent in the crash report? How many people have sent in the crash reports? I often don't send in my crash reports, but I want to encourage you to do so. And by the way, I made this slide, press send. There is no send button here, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just assumed there was a send button, but there isn't. And by the way, that is my email address. So I'm going to tell you what happens when you press Restart Firefox and send, let Mozilla know about what, what this crash was. And that is the Socorro system, the Mozilla crash, Mozilla, Mozilla crash reporting system. I heard we were talking about the church in Montana in Missoula. And so now I'm, <laughs> now I'm not going to be able to say either word properly. <laughs> So in this talk, I'm going to talk about Socorro. I'll give you an introduction about who I am, uh, and then some definitions. Uh, talk about Socorro. We're going to trace a crash through Socorro. And by the way, I am going to crash Firefox live right here in front of you. Uh, we're going to talk very briefly about the Crash Kill team. And then I'm going to talk to you about what makes Socorro possible, a system of, of Python libraries called ConfigMan. So let's start with me. Who am I? I am the web engineering herd patriarch. I'm the old man of the uh, organization. Uh, by the way, when I gave these slides to Pi Tennessee uh, in March, I didn't notice that my partner, had, who has commit access to my GitHub repo, had gone in and put some editorial comments into my slides. <laughs> that I didn't know about until I saw them come up on the screen. <laughs> so I left them in. So anyway, uh, I have been with Mozilla, uh, the Mozilla organization, for about 10 years now uh, as a full-time employee since 2008. Uh, I have been working as a contractor. Uh, I worked as a contractor first, uh, a volunteer contractor, then full-time employee. Uh, I even had the experience of working as a contractor, and all of a sudden Mozilla stopped s responding to my emails. I was working remotely. And the person I was working for had left the company, and nobody told me. <laughs> and so for two months, I kept trying to get the person to respond to me, and they never did. <laughs> but they kept paying me, so that was, that was good. <laughs> so anyway, uh, there are more of these <laughs> slides than, <laughs> than there should be. <laughs> So anyway, a crash reporting system. What is a crash reporting system? And why, why in the world would you need one? It's really about quality control after your software has already embarrassed you. You know, you really don't want to have your software crashing when it's in the customer's hands. But really, there's not much you can do about it. It's, it's going to happen, and so you might as well use the information that you get from that. So you can use it for measuring and improving your software quality. Uh, and it also allows you to test the software, the, the quality of your own QA procedures. For example, if you find that something is crashing frequently, and because you've never tested that particular feature, well, that's, that's feedback for your QA people. So it helps find ordinary bugs uncaught by QA, 
exceptional, uh, unexpected situations, strange websites. There was a time when the Google Doodle crashed Firefox. <laughs> It was a bad day. <laughs> um, we also, you can use this for detecting malware attacks and find some places where people are using the product for something you totally did not anticipate use. I had an example in mind, but I've, that's just disappeared for a moment. I'm still thinking Mozilla, 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 Mozilla. <laughs> Most of all, having a crash reporting system shows your customers that you're paying attention. That you're not just giving them a product and saying, you're on your own now. Come on, next slide. So, Socorro, our crash reporter system. It's homebrewed. Uh, there was no uh, crash reporting system, open source crash reporting system before Socorro. Uh, Firefox 2 used a system called TalkBack. It was proprietary software embedded inside an open source project. Mozilla got a lot of flack for doing that. Uh, so for Firefox 3, they decided they were going to invent their own crash reporting system. Several of the platform engineers got together, started creating this system. Uh, and as the deadline got closer and closer to Firefox 3 coming out, they got pulled off onto other projects and other projects. Meanwhile, I was sitting there with nothing to do as a contractor because uh, you know, that person had left and just left me hanging there. And so they gave me Socorro and said, oh, by the way, it has to work in three weeks when Firefox 3 comes out. Socorro was a mess. <laughs> uh, it was truly, um, well, it wouldn't work in its, in its state, and I had to do some truly horrific things to make it work in the time frame that I had. So I consider it to be software as performance art, and I'm going to show you exactly how I consider it performance art a little bit further on through this presentation. Socorro is split into two parts. Uh, there's the brake pad component, which is the client side. That's what's embedded inside Firefox and Thunderbird and other Mozilla products. And then there's Socorro, the server side. Brake pad is a joint effort between Google and Mozilla. Uh, in all of Google products, the executable products, they use brake pad. In fact, many different projects uh, throughout the open source world and proprietary world use brake pad also for sending crash reports. But Google did not open source their uh, um, server side because it used Bigtable, and they didn't want to release Bigtable uh, into the open source world. So the BreakPad C library uh, is built into all Mozilla products. It gathers forensic information from dying instance of Firefox. It interacts with the user, puts up that dialog box, and if given consent, uh, it sends crash information to Socorro. BreakPad does a truly amazing thing. Imagine your program is in the midst of crashing and you have to execute some code. It can't allocate any memory because maybe you're out of memory. It can't use the stack because maybe the stack's corrupted. It has to do all of this stuff without uh, affecting the crashing program itself. Now, there are some tricks that I don't quite understand that they do to make that work. And it does indeed work. So, BreakPad sends an HTTP post to, back to the uh, mothership at uh, Mozilla, which in this case happens to be in Phoenix, Arizona, and sends this metadata information. It sends the product name, uh, Firefox, Thunderbird, whatever, uh, and the version, uh, meta information about what time the crash happened, how, ma how many seconds since last time it crashed, how many seconds has it been since Firefox was first started. Uh, information about what add-ons you've got, what video drivers, what screen resolution you were using, and optionally, if you are willing, any comments that you put in there, uh, and the URL that you are at. You can, if you wish not to have the URL sent to us, you can just not click that URL thing. Good, that was not my phone. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, if in your comments for a crash, if you say, hi Lars, I will eventually see that. About every two months, I, I query the database to see for my name. So, <laughs> this is what the fox says when it's crashing. Who knew it was JSON? It's <laughs> <laughs> so this is the full information, plus there is a couple, or one to four binary blobs. If you want to read more information, <laughs> quick, memorize that URL. Uh, this is on my personal blog uh, about 
the format of, of all of the data inside the crash. Uh, up to four binary blobs. It has stack information, meta information about the hardware, list of loaded libraries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the moment you've been waiting for. Those of you, perhaps of delicate constitution, may wish to either avert their eyes, but I'm going to crash Firefox right in front of you. And we're going to do that. I have to kneel down here to get access to my machine. Now, there are many ways to crash Firefox. What's the, the most surefire way you know to crash Firefox? Flash player. I have an even better way. Crash me now. <laughs> crash. All right. <laughs> it's an add-on that not many people have. <laughs> so I am going to restart Firefox. Have you, by the way, have you ever seen anyone crash their presentation purposely in the middle of a presentation? Another first. All right, we shall restart Firefox. Ugh. <laughs> well, this is embarrassing. Oh, restore. Apparently, I have two copies of this going. I only need one. Back F11. Okay, what happened when that crash happened? Uh, it sent that blob of information uh, via my network connection through the AT&T network, because I didn't trust the, uh, <laughs> the local Wi-Fi, and went to Phoenix, Arizona, where it ran into what we call a collector. Now, a collector is uh, an uh, Apache process uh, that is running on six web servers in Phoenix. Uh, this is going to be an example. This is an outline of the whole system. This is you, or me, sitting right here. These are the collectors. And so what happens? Firefox crashes, and this little ghostly piece of information that, that <laughs> flows out and goes into a short-term storage. So it's a mod whiskey. It's written, uh, collectors are mod whiskey, written in uh, Python. They accept posts from break, break pad. They filter them. Uh, our um, servers are pretty much open to anything coming in. We accept all posts. So the, the collector filters the garbage. You know, sometimes people send us crap. Uh, and stores them for later retrieval. Now the collector has to run fast because we get between three and five million crashes per day. Now, three and five million, that's people who have pressed send the crash report. If you don't send the crash report, we don't get it. It doesn't go in, get, even get into that statistic. So really, we don't know how many actual crashes there are. So when it takes these crashes, these cra it shoves them into a local file system. This is, by the way, is uh, a Monday morning. Uh, these are the six collectors who are collecting crashes. You can see they're all absolutely constantly busy. That was a pretty, actually, heavy morning that, that day. Come on, next slide, please. Oops. Not three slides ahead. There we go. So the collector has a three-layer design. Now, you're going to see this, this three-layer thing several times. We have this module at the top, which uh, does our HTTP post, accepts the post. Then there's the collector code itself, which is the rule-based filtration system. And then there's file system storage at the bottom. I've made these pictures out of Legos. You'll see why in a little bit. So file system storage. How many people know of websites that use file system storage for incoming stuff? Normally, things go into a database. But we were told at the beginning that we are not allowed to lose a single crash. Databases go down. They go down a lot more frequently than file systems go down. So we chose file systems. They have 99, five nines of uptime. Uh, right now, if the entire system is down, all of our servers, everything except the collectors, we can continue to collect crashes for up to three days before we run out of memory. This is what the file system storage looks like. What happens in a Linux file system if you put more than 1,000 files into a single directory? It gets very, very slow. 
We can't be slow. So one of the original things in Socorro was just shoving uh, crashes into a directory. Well, that didn't work because of the slowness. So I remembered, being an old man, reading a paper about a hierarchical file system from the 1960s. So I dug up that paper and read about it and realized I can implement this using symbolic links in a file system. It gives me, it's called the RADIX storage scheme, it gives me log n access to any crash. All I have to do is, every crash is given an ID. All I have to do to look up that ID is, this is follow this path uh, through name. Then the first two characters, the second two characters, there's the crash, .json. Over on the other side, the date and the time that the crash came in is put into directories and a symbolic link over to where the crash is. As I read that information, I consume and delete those symbolic links. It's fast, especially now that we have those on SSDs. Okay, the next thing in the, uh, after the collectors comes what we call the crash mover. Something has to take things out of that temporary storage and put them into permanent storage. So we review, crash goes to the collectors, into local file system. I'm gonna move my mouse out of the way there. And then from the crash movers, we get a split here, and the JSON crash goes into HBase, and that gray thing up there is just the ident identification, that long um, uh, UUID uh, goes into RabbitMQ, which is a queuing system. Now this system is going to store these, the, the HBase is stored temporarily. RabbitMQ is just gonna queue that information for, to tell further systems what to do with it. That's what I just said. So the crash mover, it's a three layer form made of Legos. Uh, it reads from a file system. The crash mover itself is sort of like the null case of this three layer system. It doesn't do anything. All it does is send the data on to RabbitMQ and HBase. So HBase is our permanent storage for raw crashes. Uh, everyone know what HBase is? It's a, a essentially key value store uh, on top of Hadoop. We have 70 machines that are dedicated to HBase, uh, covering terabytes, multiple terabytes of, of crash data. We try, we were supposed to eventually store all of our crashes forever. I don't know if we'll ever get to that point. But right now, we store about three months' worth of crashes at a time. Or at least that's what our policy is. So 100 terabytes of data at the moment. RabbitMQ is a queuing system, tells the processors what to do next, saves only the crash ID. And let's go and talk about processors. Socorro, this is, this is the uh, workhorse of Socorro. So things came through the crash movers. They split into HBase and RabbitMQ. Then the processors hear about the crash from RabbitMQ. They grab a copy from HBase, and then a miracle occurs. <laughs> we take the, this uh, thing called um, uh, mini dump stack walk, and it takes this uh, raw dump that came from uh, the binary raw blob of data uh, which is the stack information, and remarries that with symbol information from the build of whatever build of Firefox you were using. And that's a pretty amazing thing right there, because uh, Firefox is not built with debug information in it. Uh, and so that's why I say it's a miracle <laughs> that occurs there. So once the processors have remarried that with symbol information, a copy of the process crash, which has all of the information about what what functions were, were in, in use, how many threads, et cetera, et cetera, gets stored into HBase. Another copy gets stored into Postgres, and yet another copy gets stored into Elasticsearch. Yeah, I've said all that. <laughs> so the stack walker takes the crash data uh, using an extensive symbol library database. You know how many builds we have, especially nightly, you know, every night we have a complete build. The, uh, the, the database of symbol information 
is almost as big as our H base. <laughs> so look, it's a three layer form. We have HBase and RabbitMQ feeding the processor, which runs Minidump StackWalk, and saves down to HBase, Postgres, and Elasticsearch. Uh, the processor uh, is written in Python, and it uses a multi-threaded model. Now that, for Python programmers, that generally means, what, multi-threaded Python, bad deal? Actually, it works out quite well because our processors are really I.O. bound. Here is our uh, 10 processors running live on a Saturday morning. Pretty, actually pretty uh, light load for processors on that day. Beyond processors, then comes the interesting thing about data analysis. We have all of the raw information about the crashes. Now we have to find some way of uh, analyzing that data. And I'm sorry I don't have a happy little animation for this, uh, this part, because I couldn't come up with anything. We're going to talk about CronTabber. CronTabber is a system of uh, running aggregate analysis uh, on all of this data. We have these little, what were originally cron jobs, little Python programs or C programs that would read the data out of Postgres or HBase or Elasticsearch and massage that data somehow. Uh, aggregate it to find out what's our top crasher, what, 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 what fails most frequently. Uh, these are the cron tabber jobs that we're currently running. And by the way, I am not a front end programmer, and I'm quite proud of myself for getting the bullet points on the right and left side there. <laughs> I have to point that out. This uh, just shows uh, cron tabber state. We have a lot of jobs that uh, depend on other jobs. We have this interface here so we can see if there's things going wrong. If this particular job is failing, that means these jobs over here are failing. CronTabber is a separate Mozilla product. Uh, you can download it and use it on your own projects if you wish. It's on GitHub. CronTabber is not a three-layer design, but it uses those same uh, modules at the bottom for, for long-term storage. Then we have this thing called the middleware. And it gives us a low-level data access. It's a RESTful API for which, you, which people can access data. Internal to Mozilla, anyone can write an application which hits our middleware, if they so desire to do their own data analysis. To this point, nobody has done so. Uh, and it is used by the Django uh, UI uh, for Socorro. So the middleware is also a three-layer design. Uh, it gets po uh, information from HTTP and then uses, does some minor transformations and uh, gets data from any of those data sources. All right, who's the consumers of all of this data? We have this group called CrashKill. It's our stability team. Uh, they look at what's happening out in the real world and do triage. They try and think, OK, this, this crash is the worst thing that's happening for us right now. We need to focus on that. And so they give feedback to the developers about what the priorities should be. All right. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't expect that. <laughs> uh, how many of you have ever heard or know about this, about crashes? Very few. Anywhere in Firefox, or any, any time in Firefox, you can go to the URL, URL bar and type about crashes. I don't think I can do this as a link. The moment, I have to jump over here and open a new tab and type about, come on, about colon crashes. This is the crash that we just did. Happened on June 25th. It's a link. You have access to all of this information when you run Firefox. Boom, took us right into the Mozilla Crash Stats program. This is Socorro. All about my crash. I should have put a comment. I should have just said hi to myself. 
Oh, actually, this is a crash I did earlier. <laughs> oh, I used a different profile. So this one I did put a comment. I tried to divide by zero, and Firefox wouldn't let me. So I can see here all sorts of information about my crash. Uh, I can see that processor number three is the one that processed. It was using the 2012 algorithm and the hybrid crash processor. And that's all internal stuff that has no meaning to you, but it's interesting to me. <laughs> so let's find out. This particular crash isn't very interesting because it was made from this uh, 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 crashing thing. Let's look at crash stats in general. This is the stability of Firefox right now as we speak. Again, this information is totally open, open access. Anyone can look at this information. We have the top current versions of Firefox. Uh, Firefox uh, 30 is this light blue line. Fortunately, it is the one with the fewest crashes. It's the one, it's, it's our release system. We have a beta, Firefox 31, which is doing pretty good too. Uh, Firefox 32, this is the Aurora release. Uh, it's not as stable. And then there's Nightly, which uh, apparently sometime around June 20th uh, or 21st, someone push, pushed some commits in there that uh, uh, made stability a little less. Let's go in and look at current production Firefox. What, is, what are the top crashers? The very top crash is out of memory. That's, that's important information to know. A crash signature is generally the name of the function that was in progress when the crash occurred. Uh, let's see, GFX content, that looks like video stuff. There's some JavaScript things causing crashes. Uh, let's just pick one of these and drill down a little deeper. That looks interesting. Actually, let's find one that isn't solved. Oh. Uh, yes. Actually, over here, this is the, the Bugzilla numbers. We can look up a crash by Bugzilla number. And if there's a line through it, that means it was probably has been resolved. Uh, I'm going to pick one of these at random and just hope that, oh, the, um, well, it may be fixed, but it's still going to have information for us. Loading signature summary, boom. And I can go down here and look directly at the reports. And here is, from the last seven days, every crash that has that signature. Each one of these represents some person having crashed. We uh, unfortunately don't have a Screen, this is a screen resolution problem here. I need to try and scroll sideways. Yeah, that's not going to work. <laughs> I want to uh, show you, if you put a comment in a crash, we are going to give it priority sorting in this screen. And, hope, and nobody said a single thing about this crash. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually is a relief because most people, when they put something, they're really upset and they use a lot of profanity. <laughs> and sometimes it's interesting to see profanity in all these different languages. <laughs> Internationalized, localized profanity. Okay, I have a presentation in here somewhere. Okay. So about crashes, remember, go in and explore your crashes, go into Bugzilla, look and see who is working on your crashes. Uh, if you have any, uh, any additional information, like, you know, I was holding the, the computer to the left-hand side or something like that, something that you might think might be relevant to help them fix the problem, the Firefox browser is your browser. We're the only browser around that isn't profit-motivated. motivated. Uh, we want to enable people to uh, uh, control their, the browser themselves, their, the, their well, I'm not speaking well on that full screen. All right. Why all those Lego um, drawings here? Uh, in the last few years, I have been the 
I used to introduce myself as saying that I am Socorro because it was my system and I am totally responsible for it. Every time I turned around, they had different requirements. Oh, we're going to use HBase. Well, now we're not going to use HBase. We're going to use something else. And then we're going to do something else. And so I created this system to be as configurable as I possibly could. Modular. So ConfigMan is a Python library that unifies all the different methods of configuration. Uh, INI files, command line arguments, environment variables. This has a, been a pet peeve of myself uh, that I've had for years about none of these things being uh, compatible with each other in the Python language. And then I had this idea, well, what if I allowed people to put in names of classes, Python classes, and then at runtime, Python would load those classes and run them. Every one of those Legos represents a class that was dynamically loaded at runtime. The crash mover, the collector, the processor, uh, the middleware, it's all the same program running underneath. All I did was configure it differently in each, uh, in each instance. We can literally change the entire architecture of Socorro on the fly. So Socorro is not a crash reporting system. Cra it, Socorro is a crash reporting Lego set that allows you to build a crash reporting system. It's being adopted by all sorts of different companies now. Spotify uses it. Uh, um, most of the big online game companies are using it now. Um, they use BrakePad, they're going to use, they use Socorro, but they don't need, they're not going to get 70 or 100 terabytes of crash data. Maybe they'll only get three or four crashes. You can even go as far as taking, let's say, that processor, and instead of putting HBase and uh, uh, um, uh, RabbitMQ as the source of information, take the HTTP model and just connect it there. So it becomes, the processor becomes the collector too. So things come directly into the processor from, from, your, uh, from your client applications. It is software as performance art, or so I think. So it does all these different things. But honestly, uh, this is all about, it's the same. I call this the fetch, transform, save system. Each one of those things being you fetch data from some data source, you transform it in some way, and then you save it back to some other data source. All configurable. So here's an example of uh, uh, a system where they want to collect things, they save things to the file system, they don't want to do HBase. HBase is a nightmare. I'm going to knock this darn thing over. HBase is a nightmare. You could just use the file system instead. File system storage. You don't need all those other components if you don't want them. You don't need a crash mover in that particular case. The apps themselves are configman enabled uh, with pluggable components. Remember I said about multi-threading scaring Python programmers? Well, they're really hot on uh, uh, greenlets, uh, um, cooperative multitasking. So I made it so that, let's say these orange things here, is the subsystem that does multitasking. You can just plug in the multi-threaded multi version and the processor or crash mover or whatever will run multi-threaded. You want uh, uh, cooperative multitasking? Just plug in the, the greenlets module or a single thread module. Anything you want. So it allows Socorro to turn on a dime, essentially. Uh, RabbitMQ was added to our system in less than a week. Uh, we are currently uh, in the process of going to move, abandon HBase and move to Ceph instead. Two days to rewrite the code and can be plugged into any of those components and it just works. Unfortunately, it has a drawback. It takes the complexity of the software and moves it into complexity of configuration. Honestly, uh, though, uh, ConfigMan is a whole nother presentation, which I'll be giving at Pi Ohio uh, in next month. So anyway, this presentation was created uh, entirely in Firefox using HTML5, SVG for those animations, dia for diagrams, Legos, actual photo photographs of Legos, those weren't. <laughs> uh, videos were processed with iMovie. Uh, the presentation framework was slides by Brian Cavalier. 
And moose training was done by uh, Pacific Moose Limited Liability Corporation. So, questions, answers, comments? Elastic Search uh, is very good at being very fast at giving uh, search information. Uh, uh, for Where does it fit into the model of storing an HDA storing a photo Well, let me move forward two slides where I have that whole animation again. I hope. There we go. So, Elastic Search is this box down here. We get once this thing eventually comes around, we get a copy of both the, that raw meta information and then the output of the processor in there. So if someone wants to go in and find out, find out all the crashes where some particular value was on the stack in a certain location, uh, where trying to do that in SQL in Postgres would have been too difficult. Um, you could have done it in HBase, but you'd have to write a MapReduce job to do that. Um, Elasticsearch allows us to have a, a, uh, a much more um, user, a better user interface for searching uh, using random criteria. Uh, the decisions on which uh, project or which systems to use here was not mine. I just implement them. They say, we want this project, I make it work. Um, I think that probably the reason they didn't go with HBase is we've always had a, a bad relationship with HBase. HBase burned us really badly at the beginning. And most of the people who do the analysis stuff, unwilling to learn. Uh, to do MapReduce jobs or other sorts of things. They want the interface to be just give us a web, web, web front end, and we're, we'll work with that. Okay, so Yeah. So let's go back a couple slides here. So uh, I blog at twobraids.com. So I uh, braided my beard today, not only so the mic wouldn't just be beard rustle, but so that you will remember, twobraids.com. <laughs> and this presentation you can find at this URL. <laughs> Memorize that quick. <laughs> There'll be, it'll be published here somewhere uh, by the organization. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you get one of those OOM crashes. There's no way to tell our system that we don't have a facility to give pre-crash information or, or, or um, information about what's going on in the process when there's not a crash going on. Um, and while it would be possible for us to do that, I would imagine there would be some privacy implications of that. Um, uh, people don't like to have their browser phone home when at, at times that they don't control. Um, Lucas, do you know anything more about that? About how, you know, pre-crash information. How, you know, if something's going wrong in the system before a crash happens. I don't think we have anything anything that would. Yeah. I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry. So. What, what operating system? This is on my Windows machine. And what latest version of Firefox? Yes, because I keep that. Mm -hmm. I know that we've had problems in the past with, with memory problems. We, this, that, that 
crash that you saw that we said OOM small. Um, that is a new thing that we have just added about two weeks ago. Um, I have a feel we are in the process of starting to really focus on out of memory crashes and what is the situation that's causing out of memory crashes. So hopefully we'll, we'll get a handle on this sort of uh, problem before. Um, I just heard this uh, thing they're going to start doing. Uh, we don't have the information now uh, about when a crash happens of how many tabs were open uh, or that kind of information. <laughs> So we'll start getting that information soon. Pardon? Yes. <laughs> we have no motive to do anything bad with your data. <laughs> yes? Oh, I, I just didn't know where that was Yep. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, just um, as a little plug, I'm giving another talk tomorrow morning, uh, a hardware talk on hacking a uh, pellet stove in a yurt to work with a Nest thermostat. All right, thanks. <laughs>